So I want to talk about polyzonohedra. Um, this is a type of polyhedron that uh, I just kind of like and uh, thought I would share some of the joy with you. Uh, let me begin by showing a little uh, video clip. Uh, so this is a little library uh, that I made. Um, it's uh, currently full of books and in the front lawn of our house, but here it is under construction. Um, and it's a place that anyone can come and take a book and borrow a book. And uh, when I was thinking about what shape to make, uh, the shape that I chose is a polar zonohedron. Uh, so this is just a nice example of how uh, mathematics provides us with all kinds of uh, kind of a storehouse of forms. And we can sort of go to that when we need something that's uh, interesting for a particular application. Uh, so as a polar zonohedron, you see there's a pole up at the top. Uh, the one you're looking at is tenfold. It has a tenfold axis of symmetry. Um, and then all the faces are rhombi. So there's a series of rhombuses, different angles, uh, but they fit together in a nice crisp kind of clean geometric form. Uh, of course, I've adapted it by adding a door and that kind of rain gutter and uh, windows, et cetera. Um, but that's sort of a, uh, a polyzonohedron in a nutshell and what my original motivation was that sort of led me to write this paper. Okay, so before going into my slides, let me see if I can bring up a little notebook here in Mathematica. Uh, just to give you a sort of a, a, a feeling for the variety of polyzonohedra. Um, so here's an example that I can kind of spin around and look at. And there's really just two parameters that you can vary. It's a very constrained family of forms. Um, these points at the top and bottom are called poles and we have this rotational symmetry. And I have a slider here that I can adjust that. So here's, for example, is a six-fold polyzonohedron. And uh, I can increase it and go up and get kind of a uh, sexier one with lots of uh, symmetry. Still always made of rhombi, two special vertices that have a lot of uh, faces meeting there. The generic vertex has four faces, four edges coming. And uh, if I lower it, you can see next to the pole, uh, there's another kind of special vertex that has just three edges, three faces meeting, uh, the, the ones that are adjacent to the poles. Uh, the other parameter I can vary is the angle uh, of sharpness. So if I make a sharp angle, so relative to horizontal here, this is almost 90 degrees. Uh, I get a kind of cigar shape. And if I go the other way, I get a kind of a pancake shape. And it's just sort of stretching along the z-axis, so to speak. Uh, and those are the two parameters that you've got. Uh, there isn't much that you can vary uh, in a polyzonohedron. Um, as a special case, if I slide this all the way down to three, the lowest order I can make, uh, I get, in this case, a cube for this particular angle, but in general, a uh, parallel pipette of some, some shape. Uh, and another nice angle of interest, uh, another number of special case is a four. Uh, this gives me a rhombic dodecahedron as another special case. It's a fourfold polyzonohedron. Um, and the other thing I wanted to show you with this demo is how you can generate one step by step. Uh, so if I start with just one level of faces, uh, the real beginning is a set of these ribs. They're like umbrella ribs. And between any two, I can create the rhombus that spans that plane. And then if I continue, I can add uh, another row and another row and another row uh, until they close up at the other point. Um, this point is the vector sum of the umbrella ribs that I started with. So it's kind of a unique sum makes everything close up. Um, and there's many mathematical ways to describe it. It's a Minkowski sum of these ribs and uh, there's, it's, there's a, a large mathematical uh, story behind them, but I won't go through all that here. I'll just say it's, uh, it's generated up here in uh, basically four lines of Mathematica code. 
Um, I can, with some sines and cosines and spherical coordinates, create the umbrella ribs. I can define a vertex. Each vertex is a vector sum, sort of the parallelogram rule. If I add these three vectors, I get a sum of two and then a sum of another one. So each vertex is a, some kind of sum. Uh, the faces is a combination of four in the right cyclic order, and then I can display them. So here in four lines of Mathematica code, we can generate uh, this whole family of things. Uh, if you're interested in, in the mathematical side, uh, check the paper. I won't go into that here. Um, let me instead uh, come to uh, some examples of polar zonohedra. So. Okay, this is just a repeat of what I've already showed you. Um, special cases of n equals three or four are here for five and varying the angle gives you the spectrum of possible shapes. Um, there's a special magic angle of about 35 and a bit degrees that uh, gives us the cube and the rhombic dodecahedron and that also maximizes the volume. Um, but again, I'll, I'll refer you to the paper for that. Um, and this is, again, uh, an illustration of how you can start with these umbrella ribs and uh, grow the shape in a very simple procedural way. Um, so I didn't tell you what a zone is or a zonohedron, uh, but uh, these, because the faces are all rhombi, they're parallelograms, that means for each edge, there's a parallel edge, and you can follow chains of parallel edges. And the faces that belong to those chains, say all these blue faces, they're called a zone. So here's another zone, the red zone. Uh, each face is the intersection of two zones. And uh, each zone is sort of a belt that goes all the way around. So if a zone intersects in the front, they also intersect around back with a, a parallel equal face. Um, so the whole shape ends up having central symmetry. For each face on one side, there's an equal opposite parallel face on the other side. And that, that adds to part of the beauty. Um, and that's true of a whole class of polyhedra called polar zonohedra, I'm sorry, called zonohedra. And the, uh, the polar zonohedra I'm talking about today is a special case of that, this very nice symmetrical one with the poles. Um, another beautiful feature of the polar zonohedron that part of uh, their aesthetic appeal is they have these spirals. If you follow an edge and keep kind of walking straight around, you go from one pole to the other along this lovely helix. Uh, looking down from the top, you can see uh, the projection onto the xy plane, so to speak, is a regular polygon. Uh, it's exactly half the radius of the whole thing. Um, so it's in fact, it's a discrete helix. And that's part of uh, what makes these things so beautiful. You have these nice, lovely curves. Okay, so uh, a bit of history. Uh, the Russian crystallographer Fedorov uh, discovered these and wrote about them very nicely back in 1885. Uh, he wrote in Russian, so no one in the West uh, read about it or knew about it. Um, some crazy person named Franklin wrote uh, a really bizarre paper uh, in the Math Gazette in, 19, in 1937, um, all about how if you studied polar zonohedra, uh, they can help you understand hyperspace and the completeness of things and phenomena. Um, the spiritual side of it is kind of crazy, um, but the mathematical side of defining a polar zonohedron uh, is accurate. And that's the first introduction of them into a, kind of a, a Western language. Uh, then Coxeter wrote a very uh, well-known book on polytopes in 1948 was the first edition. And it has a, a nice, sane, uh, readable, understandable presentation of polar zonohedra and, and zonohedra in general. Uh, Coxeter's student, uh, Bruce Chilton, uh, and him, they wrote uh, the only real math paper about polar zonohedra in the American Mathematical Monthly in 1963. And the only other publication ever with the title Polar Zonohedron, as far as I know, uh, is a paper by Russell Towley, um, who in 1996 uh, wrote a graphics article uh, in how to generate them in Mathematica. Um, so the literature on polar zonohedra is really uh, sparse, uh, part of the reason why I wrote this paper. In fact, the polar zonohedra are not even mentioned in Wikipedia uh, as of today. It's a, it's a very strange uh, omission because they are such a beautiful shape and uh, they have gotten to be very well known. Um, so anyway, if, if you want more about the literature, other references, uh, I'll refer you back 
to the paper. Um, but many people have applied them, especially in uh, architectural applications. So the, the most well-known example uh, is what's called the Gherkin Building in London. Uh, officially, it's 30 St. Mary Axe by uh, Norman Foster and Partners. A beautiful skyscraper, and it's based on an 18-fold polar zonohedron, uh, slightly modified, slightly adjusted, uh, but clearly that's the underlying shape that uh, makes this so elegant. Uh, those uh, surface helices are, are beautifully brought out. Um, the earliest attempt at something like that form that I've discovered uh, is something called the Glass Pavilion uh, by German architect Bruno Taut. And uh, this was uh, sort of revolutionary in its time for its use of glass, that there's structural glass cells here and these big glass panels in the roof. Um, unfortunately, he didn't know about polar zonohedra. Um, so I find these lines really kind of disappointing. If you follow these lines, they just have this wiggle because they're not quite a polar zonohedron. Um, it looks like there's a row of rhombuses at the bottom, but then all the upper rows are kites. And the, the geometry is just slightly off. That makes it a little bit disappointing once you know what it could have looked like if it, if it did have those beautiful helices of a polar zonohedron. Um, the person who really brought polar zonohedra into uh, the world uh, is Stephen Baer, uh, a US architect. Um, he made a number of uh, sort of unusual domes and of various sorts, uh, unusual buildings uh, starting in the 1960s. Uh, the earliest one I've been able to find is this one called the Llama Dome. And uh, it has an eightfold polar zonohedron shape at the top. Uh, let me click here. Uh, here you can see it under construction and here's another view of the inside. Uh, so Bear started building these domes and uh, showing the people and writing about it. And really uh, he saw the, the value. There's a lot of architectural reasons why a zonohedron has advantages over uh, a geodesic dome. So I should mention a geodesic dome is based on having the vertices on a sphere. And that ends up leaving you to make many, many different lengths and angles. Whereas a zonohedral dome uh, doesn't have the vertices on a sphere, but it means you have great regularity and great parallelism and, and uh, reusability. So it's, uh, it's very natural to use them in architectural uh, scale applications. Um, Bear wrote a number of publications that popularized it. So here, for example, is a, a seven-fold polar zonohedron in uh, Bear's book, uh, The Zone Primer. Um, and he learned it from Franklin. This is the, uh, the completeness of things in phenomena author, but he, he, Bear was able to extract the good math and ignore the nonsense. Uh, his dome cookbook also has uh, polar zonohedra as well. Uh, but the person who's really taken them to another level, uh, in my opinion, most creative practitioner uh, is Rob Bell. Uh, sadly died a couple of years ago, uh, but he built a number of beautiful art buildings, uh, mostly for Burning Man, but he also uh, tried them out in other areas. Um, so these are made of plywood cut on a numerically controlled uh, milling machine, uh, numerically controlled router, I guess, um, and uh, buildings based on not just zonohedra, but clusters of them and variations of them that are, are just truly stunning, truly beautiful. Just shows you how uh, a little mathematical knowledge can really enrich uh, an artwork in a nice way. <clears throat> so he led teams of people and, and did all the design and led the fabrication and the transportation and the fundraising. Um, he put an amazing amount of uh, love and energy into polar zonohedra. Uh, and there he is standing on top of one. Um, for those of you who are longtime Bridges attendees, uh, this is from Bridges 2009 uh, in Banff. Um, and the shape in the back is not quite a polar zonohedron. It's based on a rhombic tricontahedron, which is a variation on a polar zonohedron. Uh, but it has, uh, as it struts, each of these edges is in fact uh, a tenfold polar zonohedron, just sort of joined at the points to its neighbors. So it's based on polar zonohedron, both in fine scale and in the overall scale. And this was built over three days or so by um, you know, hundreds of people attending the conference, uh, putting a great deal of uh, labor into a, a huge zone tool construction. Um, so let me go back uh, to some of my constructions. 
Uh, this is uh, the little zonohedral library, which now we'll recognize as having a tenfold pole at the top, truncated at the bottom, and uh, modified as a, as a library. Uh, but I built many other uh, examples. Uh, here's a cardboard thing, laser cut pieces. Uh, this can be built in a classroom as an educational model. Uh, you may not be able to see, but it's held with little black binder clips on the inside. There's little flaps that fold in and join in pairs. Um, and then with that idea, you can make uh, all kinds of variations and, and fairly large scale examples um, if you have a laser cutter to uh, accurately cut the pieces. Um, here's another example. This is one I call the Zonodome. Uh, this was made using 3D printed connectors uh, at a conference in Atlanta a couple of years ago. Uh, hundreds of people each made the connectors. I, I put the files online and put out a call and mailed them into this conference. And then with a bunch of one foot dowels, we assembled the whole thing. Um, it's kind of a, a fun group project. And uh, again, if you refer back to my paper uh, in the references, there's a link to a web page. If you want to reproduce this, this or use the software there to create your own lens and angles for your own custom design, uh, check that out. And then I want to wrap up by just saying, uh, in mathematics, whenever you learn anything, you always want to look at uh, generalizations and variations. Uh, so once you're familiar with the polar zonohedron, um, there's lots of little things you can do to tweak it. Uh, so the top of this is a polar zonohedron, and the bottom of this is a polar zonohedron. But there's one extra zone in the middle. Uh, if you take out this middle band, this belt, the two parts would go together and make a polar zonohedron. Uh, adding this extra set of, of uh, rhombi in the middle allows you to make it a little bit taller. These edges are parallel to the axis, so we've maintained the rotational symmetry. Uh, and that's just a, a common variation on a polar zonohedron. If you're making a dome uh, or a, a outdoor garden, greenhouse or whatever, um, that's a, a common uh, change to make. Uh, here's a variation where you take two and you fuse them together. If you translate the vertex on to, uh, well, the pole of one to a vertex of another, uh, they fit together perfectly. Those surface helices are all congruent, uh, so they match up without any gap. Um, let me see if I can overlay a little video here um, to show that you can, you can do this in all kinds of combinations and make uh, wonderful clusters and whole cities based on polar zonohedron. Um, and so anyway, that, that's sort of another direction to go uh, once you fall in love with individual ones. Um, another degree of freedom is you can stretch it. So uh, if the axis is the Z direction, here I've stretched it in the X and the, or Y direction uh, to give you an elliptical footprint. Uh, that's kind of a, a linear affine transformation. So it means we still have planar faces, we still have parallelism, uh, but now instead of just rhombi, we have all kinds of parallelograms and slightly different angles. Uh, so to actually build a structure like this um, takes a lot of care to get all the right pieces in the right places. Uh, but Rob Bell online has a beautiful greenhouse that he made, which is an elliptical variation of a polar zonohedron. Um, an absolutely gorgeous variation is what's called a spiralohedron. Um, so this is a, a side view and a top view of the same object. Um, it's amazingly close to a polar zonohedron. It's, it's surprising that this wasn't discovered until around 1990. Um, Russell Towley, who I mentioned before, uh, ran into these by dissecting. Uh, let me see if I could overlay a little video of that just to give you different views of it. Um, so the threefold variation on these, the top two are threefold. Uh, those can pack space if you alternate them with sixfold uh, variations. And the fourfold variation at the bottom, those can pack space just as they are. Those are space filling objects. They can be you know, replicated without gaps or overlaps uh, to tessellate all of 3D space. Um, wonderful story there and not well written at all, um, not documented. Um, people need to learn about that because they're, they're just lovely. And um, one more variation. Um, what I've been calling a polar zonohedron, what the literature calls a polar zonohedron, is really just one lobe of this long infinite thing. Uh, so the infinite shape just follows the same algorithm uh, in both directions. This is the natural kind of closure or com completing of the zonohedral algorithm. Uh, and it's 
uh, once you look at it, you, you discover that it's part of a, a large family of related beautiful forms that are basically the same algorithm. You're just kind of offsetting or negating indexes for, for which directions to use, but it's still based on one set of umbrella ribs uh, being sort of closed in a natural way of, of completing them. Um, and uh, here's an animation of uh, the same idea, but, but morphing slightly uh, how things go. But there's, there's enormous room and potential for people to explore. All right, so I think I'm going to end there and move to questions. I'll first say um, there's more references, more things to see, details and math details in my paper. Um, if you want to see how I constructed that little uh, zonohedral library, I have a YouTube video. You can look that up. And if you want to see many examples out in the real world of, um, you know, stained glass domes and uh, hats and, uh, uh, you know, yurts and whatever else, greenhouses, full-scale houses, uh, the keyword is zone. That was Steve Baer's term for a zonohedral dome. Uh, Google zone images and you'll find lots of examples. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'll hold up a zone tool example. If you want to learn on your own, uh, play with zone tool. Uh, the zone tool geometry book has examples. This is a five-fold one um, just to show but you can make all kinds of examples very nicely because zone tool enforces parallelism basically. So you can't help but make parallelograms. Um, and if everything is still working technically, I'd be very happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, George. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one of them was asking, can you add more than one extra vertical zone? Like when you split it and there was the vertical zone, is it possible uh, to add more than one? Yes, um, I don't have a good video of that. Um, but yes, there's, there's many variations. Uh, that little zonohedral library video that I mentioned, I have a couple of examples on that. There's a instructions on how to make a walrus. You can look at the walrus. That might be the sort of thing uh, the question is, is looking thinking of. And um, do you know if any of the domes at uh, St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow in any way approximate zonohedra? Uh, I don't know uh, that particular example. Uh, the traditional kind of what's called an onion dome in the West is kind of a dome that you find in kind of Greek Orthodox architecture is similar to a, uh, a polyzonohedron. Um, I've not seen ones where the structure is evident that indicates they're exactly a polyzonohedron, but they're, they're certainly um, you know, the same aesthetic in some sense. Right. Um, is there a connection with the space filling and the regular tilings of the plane? Like the dual of the triangle grid is the hexagonal grid and the square grid is the dual of itself? Yes. So if you make that space filling that Russell Talley discovered and take all the horizontal slices, each one is a well-known tessellation of the plane with different size squares or with hexagons and triangles. Nice. Um, let's see. So someone's asking if the angles adding is necessary or if it's also sufficient. The angles adding, I'm not understanding. Yeah, Bob, can you expand on that? I think that's a reference to someone earlier asked a question about how you can tell if things fill space. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it was referencing that. Space um, has to do with them being based on a squares or triangles and hexagons. You can vary the angle at, at will and they'll still fill space. The angle doesn't, uh, doesn't affect that packing. You're just stretching all of the filled space in the Z direction when you change the angle. Um, okay, uh, there are a couple more questions in the chat, but I'm wondering if I should give time for people to switch rooms. I think so. All right, well, thank you all for uh, coming and uh, I'll be in the uh, Gather Town space or always available by email, happy to, to discuss further, answer more questions. Thank you. Thank you, George.